All right, welcome everyone uh, to our afternoon panel, standing between you and the weekend, I suppose. Uh, uh, so moving to uh, competency-based uh, learning um, is, our, is the topic of our conversation. Uh, very excited uh, to have the folks up here on the panel. I'm not gonna go through bios or anything like that, but I'll just note that at the end we've got Liz, Andy, uh, and then we've got Paula, and then right here we've got Becky. Uh, and uh, I think we're gonna have a good conversation about competency-based learning, the promise of it, uh, why uh, uh, sometimes where it struggles, uh, and get some, get some real talk, hopefully, around uh, that, so that you all can start to think about as you move into competency-based learning, or, or uh, where are the benefits and pitfalls of it? And it's topical today because I believe Minnesota just moved forward legislation literally a couple hours ago uh, to allow competency-based learning throughout their state. So uh, very topical right now. So uh, any one of you want to jump in on my first question, which is I'd love um, for the audience to start to get a flavor for where you all stand on this conversation. Uh, and the first question being why competency-based learning? Because I think Everyone often has a different why for why they're excited about this move to uh, focusing on uh, making the learning constant and time variable. So you want to lead us off from uh, the jump rope? Uh... Sure, I would be happy to. Um, my background is a little interesting. I'm here today as a researcher for a company called Jump Rope that um, produces a standards-based grade book. But I recently vacated the position of director of curriculum in a district in Maine where we spent the past six years transitioning our entire uh, 3,000 student system to what we call a main proficiency-based learning. Um, so quick note that our decision in my former district was um, we were sending many students off to colleges, having been on our honor roll for many years, who couldn't finish their first year of college. Uh, that was one big red flag that we knew something was come conflating their grades and we needed to separate those things out. Uh, we also had an influx of English language learners and we realized we were underserving um, whole populations within our district. So we wanted to revamp everything from the ground up and get very clear on what was expected, hold teachers and students to knowing what the targets were. Um, many of my colleagues in the state of Maine, though, started the work because a law passed and put a deadline on it, which about seven months ago the state did away with the law, but that pushed the entire state that way. And summarily speaking, what I see across the United States and internationally working for Jump Rope is a combination of, of those reasons. Um, there are some schools that open their doors with this in mind. Um, they want to be a very competency-based, um, customized experience for students. I see places where laws have gone into effect and people are then deciding to do it and others who are, who are tackling it from the research and, and some of the best practices and they want to implement it. Um, so I am an assistant superintendent in a suburban district in Rhode Island and our sense of urgency came from um, a different place. So Rhode Island is or does have proficiency-based graduation requirements, but that really wasn't our sense of urgency. Um, for us, our students are high-performing, and often in a high-performing district, um, it's very difficult to uh, see a reason for change because you're already doing well. Uh, our students um, had the opportunity to engage in the OECD test for schools, which is based on PISA, for two years in a row. And with that test, you actually get the results back. And what was um, astounding for us wasn't the results, which were a high performing results, but the student survey, in which they told us that they didn't see the connection between what they were learning in their classes and what they would do beyond college. They saw performing well in school as the way to get into college, but not connected to anything real or authentic. And for us, that was um, a pretty scary concept that our students were not really going to be prepared to be global citizens, to be able to be competitive um, with peers across the globe, and that they didn't see those connections. And we knew that we needed to uh, shift our paradigm if we were going to support them. We've got a student. I'd love to hear, like, for you. No, um, you, you, you jump in first, yeah. Um, my personal opinion of um, competency-based learning and changing it and to the new shift, I believe is a good way of 
receiving tasks and giving get receiving feedback because with the old grading system I was able to get a, um, a B or an A and I understood the topic but sometimes I could pass and not completely understand something and with my friends they also receive a C or a D and they just tell me I'm passing that's good enough but with competency based learning it kind of pushes us further and continue on working on the topics that we need help with because with just pushing a task to the side it will come back to us the next grade or to college or maybe even to our next job that we want to be in. That's great. Um, so Andy gave a good example of what sort of the opposite um, thing that Paula was talking about. I think we really had a, a, a culture of um, passing and that, that, that was good enough. Um, mm. We're an urban, um, our, most of our population is urban population. We're a regional vocational um, public school here in Massachusetts. Um, that is um, based on competencies in terms of a vocational, but yet that has not been what our grading system has been. Um, and it has just been this, I'm passing, I'm okay. So it was really for us about getting students to be able to critically think and to evaluate and analyze how they're doing. And we've just been doing it a short time in our STEAM program and we've just already seen amazing, <coughs> amazing results from it. Cool, so my next question is sort of as you step back, Forget about what you see happening in your here and now in, in your districts, obviously in your school. Uh, you get to see a lot of things across the country. Um, but I'm curious, like in your idealized vision for what competency-based learning would look like, paint that picture for us uh, before we talk about what it actually looks like today. Um, what it looks like right now. Um, oh, yeah, go for it. No, no, go for it. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> um, hold on, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, with this competency-based learning, it helps me, like, say I'm already a senior and I'm trying to get a job. If I don't, if I don't have this competency-based learning, I could receive a C and go into that job. And that tells them I passed my previous class, but it does not tell them that I'm ready for the job. And with competency-based learning, with the program we're using, Lyft is telling us that we reached mastery or exemplary, and it's telling um, my employers that I'm able to do this task and I'm also able to teach it to other people. So um, for me, the vision it involves a larger, wider stakeholder group, including higher ed, business partners, the community, and um, in an environment where there's an understanding of the competencies that the students are working on. There's a way to communicate that for the students who want to go on to higher ed that's, that is accepted and understood by higher ed. Um, and that those competencies are informed and supported by our local businesses and local communities so that we can break down the walls of the school so learning's happening both on campus and off campus um, with partners. Uh, for that, and and I mean all the way down to our lower level um, uh, grades in our elementary schools. You know, right now we have opportunities for our students to be doing service projects all the way down to kindergarten, and that can be a powerful piece of competency-based education. But I think if the receiving end, if the the colleges, universities, and businesses don't understand that, or don't have a way to be a partner in developing that vision. Um, then we might be doing our students a disservice. So we really need to make sure we're partnering on this work. Um, I think of it just in terms of from when they leave high school, and again, sort of to what Andy's point of that students are truly leaving with the skills that we want them to leave with, and that they really have those 21st century skills um, after they finished four years of, because I'm sort of looking at it just at the school level, at the high school level. Mm -hmm. For me, um, it seems trite to say it's about student agency over their learning, but um, I used to say this with my teachers all the time, and I say it um, to anybody who will listen, that for me, all of this is about um, having students who know what's expected, know where they are in their learning, what they know, what they don't know yet, to be able to get feedback so they know where they have to go next, and who have the skills to advocate for what they need to eventually reach those targets. And so for me, this building these kinds of systems, that's all inherent in it. And um, 
really forces us to develop the really good instructional practices to support that. Mm -hmm. And so in the future, I would envision that that's the model of schooling, that it's about as little or as big as the students are, they know what they need to do, they know where they are, they can talk about it, they can ask for what they need next. Yeah, I want to piggyback on that. I think that that vision includes our students really becoming active in their civic life and really understanding that they can be the change um, and that they have already the opportunity to give back and the capacity to give back to the communities in which they live. But I do think that that instructional component is key. How are we connecting the instructional strategies and pedagogy to that strong content so that the student has both the skills and the knowledge base um, to be highly effective in their advocacy and in their work in the community. I'm sitting here making mental notes of where I want to move to uh, with my kids. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, so, so my next question is, so th these visions sound amazing. Um, what does it actually look like today? Like, take us inside a classroom. Um, maybe you can go last, because you can give us yep. a flare of different ways that you see it implemented. Mm -hmm. But take, a, take us down a level. You know, maybe Andy, we'll start with you. Like, um, you know, what does your learning look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, it's a lot different compared to last year with the regular old grading system. Um, with the new competency-based grading system, everyone's at their own pace, at their own level. So no kid is being forced to learn something higher up when they hadn't learned the last task. And with that, that also helps them and also doesn't push back the other kids that has already learned that task. So it's everybody at their own pace, but everyone's getting a good lesson in, in, in a single class. Um, I wanna talk about it from both the reporting piece and then from what the students are doing piece. So the reporting piece in, in our district um, we have moved towards standards-based, competency-based report cards, but only up through grade five. Um, there is still a concern or a fear that if we move to competency-based or standards-based reporting at the older levels, that the students will not have the same opportunities to enter into um, really strong universities. And so what we've done is we've created a hybrid system that includes portfolio, it includes a proficiency report card, but it also includes a traditional report card. And so that is a transition solution that we have felt was necessary in our environment. But what does it look for, like for the students? Um, at the elementary level, we carefully chose curriculum and we really work with our teachers on what that instructional pedagogy um, looks like to support uh, this type of learning. So for us, it was expeditionary learning. Um, right now, our third grade students, for example, are working on what it means to read and books around, around the world and how students get their books around the world. And then they've engaged in a community service project um, where they have organized their own fundraiser, that's a talent show, and they're collecting uh, and they're, they're doing their whole budgeting piece around the cost of the event and collecting books that they're going to be able to share with kids around the world that don't have access to the same kinds of um, resources that they do. At the middle school, our students were, um, over half of our students bike to school uh, at the middle school, so around 450 students show up in there with their bikes every single day, and they were concerned because they felt that the community members were speeding too much in our town. Um, and so through our math and science, we, they learned about how to calculate speed using two fixed objects, and they did their own study of what the speeds were in the town. Um, they crafted uh, argumentative um, responses about how we could go about fixing that, and they're presenting that to the chief of police, the town council, and the school committee. So that's something that is pretty active. Um, we're also building a new middle school. They helped us redesign the space. Um, they helped us redesign the makerspace. They gave us input into what they wanted their learning to look like. At the high school, um, we are creating pathways where students have experiential pathways or career and tech pathways. The career and tech ends in a certification with dual enrollment. So they're working both within school, um, at the college level, in their internship programs, and they graduate um, with a capstone exhibition of that learning. So you can see that by um, 
mapping the experiences so that what we expect or what we think of as a graduate of our district, they're practicing that every year from kindergarten until it's time to graduate. So we're able to capture those competencies that we've defined, which are the deep, deeper learning competencies as defined by the Hewlett Foundation and then the standards, which are the Common Core and NGSS. Anything else? Yeah. Um. Gee, that's, she's always, she's always <laughs> I mean, if, if, if he summarized <laughs> it, then we're great. But uh, yeah, anything, uh, anything you'd add? I, I think um, for what it looks like today, I think, um, again, Andy did a good job of, of talking about that. It's, it's been, um, we have, the, how we work is that we're transdis transdisciplinary project-based learning. So it's been a group of amazing teachers working together to really figure out what those competencies are, certainly based off the standards, um, and then having the students responsible for them and having they have a trimester over which they're working on different competencies for it. Um, they, we have advisory where students really dig into those competencies where they might be needing some more support or needing to um, well, more in the, or you know, wanting to move ahead on it. Um, I think um, Becky said it would be trite to talk about it with the student agency, but it is right. It is amazing again to see what is happening where students are having to take responsibility over their learning. So, in terms of when we think of like, what are we seeing, or what does it look like now? Like, we're seeing a huge shift in a very short time from students who, not specifically you, Andy, or the ones <laughs> right in the audience, but in general from students who would say, okay, I, I passed, or I got, I got a C, I'm done, to, okay, what do I need to do to get to this higher level? Um, the other thing, and maybe that comes into another question, but it really sticks with me, is that um, pretty early on we had a revolt of the students, um, and um, I don't know if they got the, the um, the, oh my goodness, my word just left me. I don't know if they got the, um, the, the, oh my gosh, what is it? The answer that they were expecting um, because when they came forward with um, a um, petition and all the reasons why they didn't like the competency-based learning, um, they didn't get any resistance. They got like, oh my gosh, we're so proud of you because it was just <laughs> yeah. so fantastic of, um, Again, just even watching those resiliency skills. Um. Blossom, yeah. yeah. I, so maybe I'm gonna cut you off before you do the vision, but because I think it's a perfect segue actually into the next question, which is how have you gone about implementing competency-based learning and what are the big barriers and roadblocks? Um, so I'd, I'd love you to talk, maybe, maybe jump us off there into the different pathways that you've seen. And I'd love you to spend also two minutes if you could on the main legislation pullback of competency-based learning or, or proficiency-based, just because mm -hmm. nationally when that happened, um, I think there were a lot of people out there that were like, see, told you so, mm -hmm. this isn't gonna work. Um, and so I'd, I'd love your perspective on that as well. Oh, absolutely, um, so I'll start with that since I was in the room for all of the hearings and the minute that it happened. Um, and it was, um, I think Maine did what it often does, which tries to be progressive and put something out there. Um, and the Department of Ed was not very um, clear on writing the rules and regulations to support it. And they pretty much gave a year, a deadline, to issue a proficiency diploma. So from the day that the law passed until when the diploma was due, we had four and a half years which meant you had to, within months, start thinking about how to do this in a high school. So if you hadn't been thinking about this, um, it was overwhelming. So immediately they started a waiver process and an extension process, and that took up the time that should have been given to coming to some understandings and, uh, for rules to guide the work. And so what happened was it felt like the work was too daunting, um, it was thrown on parents and students at high school level without a lot of forethought, which created a huge upswell of, of a backlash, and it just slowly started disintegrating. And the, each year they would propose legislation to ameliorate that intensity, extend the deadline, do a phase-in plan. Um, but ultimately what happened was um, it just started to crumble on the ground, and. Um, 
it kind of fed the fire of the mm -hmm. backlash. It really, for me though, comes down to um, they, the timing, they, they should have made it a decade roll in or, or asked for it to start at the middle level at the very least, um, mm -hmm. but they didn't. And I think that was really truly the death knell because having done this work systemically, I know it's the hardest at the high school. It was much easier to hmm. see it live K-8. So um, why, why is that? Um, if you're going about it as far as, um, well, look, I think uh, Paula indicated some of that. There is the, a fear that um, colleges don't know how to look at a proficiency transcript. Um, there's, it was a phenomenal thing for us to realize um, that Typically, we don't share transcripts with kids and parents. I mean, my own daughter graduated two years ago, and we didn't, we've never seen her official transcript. It's not part of what we do in schools. Um, most parents and, and teachers don't understand actually what the information on a transcript gives to um, a college. So I think the colleges were very unprepared to answer, Could you, would you admit a student mm. on this transcript? Um, so I think that the fear of that alone makes it very hard for teachers and, and parents to accept it at the high school, no matter how good the practices may be. Mm. So I'd love to just hear from, from all of you um, how, how, you, how you've gone about implementation and biggest barriers and roadblocks be, besides the student revolt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for us, we always start together as an admin team, so we're relatively small. We have six buildings, um, and we meet regularly around our strategic vision every single Tuesday. And so in, in working through um, Northeastern, we developed a logic model that talked about where we were in our current context and where we wanted to go and the steps that would need to happen to be there. We looked at our, our current reality. We asked why until we couldn't ask why anymore. Um, we developed a plan, do, study, act that, um, that allowed us to continue to, to look at these things. And we mapped out what our vision of the graduate was starting with kindergarten and mapped it all the way up. It was what we found was in working with other high schools that when they had students arrive to them who didn't come from schools that provided experiential learning and hands-on opportunities, it was a real different shift for those students and they had a difficult time understanding that they were in charge of their learning um, and that it was a different way of learning. And so we felt that it was really important that we begin with kindergarten and work all the way through. And the um, biggest piece that helped do that was having coaching for the teachers. So creating, you know, these are our early adopters, these are the fence sitters, these are the people who we need to work a little bit harder with and creating cohorts around a coaching model. But they were very much involved in the design thinking process around that. We had hackathons around it and the coaching still continues today. Oh, I'm like so impressed hearing that and not wanting I <laughs> teach you to hear that. So we're, we're, um, our innovation program is part of our larger uh, vocational school, and the whole school is not, is not doing this at this time. So with the innovation program, it's been probably from day one of everything we've done. We have jumped in like feet first, or head first, I don't know which it is, and it's all moving just very, very fast. So it was not, um, I do not have quite that thoughtful story. Certainly we were behind, we, we were dedicated to company-based learning. It was part of our whole our whole plan, but in terms of how we actually went about it, we had sort of a slow start with the teacher, not slow, but a start with the teachers um, at the end of last year, but we really didn't have a great tool of how we were even managing any of it. Um, and it wasn't until summer that we sort of jumped in and the minute the students started their 10th grade, so they, they all of a sudden were, going, were doing things differently. So. Um, I mean, I feel like we did so many things wrong. Like we're just, it's obvious, I don't, you know, <laughs> but, but we're doing it. And it is like amazing, um, again, to watch what is happening from it. I had another student um, as part of the revolt, but a different, not, not from the petition, who sat down and didn't want to be in this STEAM program anymore. Again, we have, we're vocational school. We have 18 different programs that students could be in, but this was the only one where the, the academics were completely integrated for this transdisciplinary project-based learning. 
And, he, and I said, well, tell me about why you want to leave. I want to understand it. And so he went on and described every single reason why we are doing competency-based learning. Um, and I started laughing. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm not laughing at you. But you are like, you're like a poster child for what we are trying to do. And it was about, it is hard. It is hard, but I, I am learning, and I am taking ownership. He didn't say it quite that way, but sure. it was it was just amazing. And he did laugh at that point. Um, he still didn't want to stick with it, but he, he understood that, and he didn't want to put that in. So I would never recommend the way that we did it, um, I, but I'm really thankful to the students and staff that we've had, and we've been able to do this small um, program within our larger school. Curious, Becky, how, how, how would you say, sorry, did I cut you off, Andy? Um, yeah, go for I it. I kind of want to add on what she yeah, was saying. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Um, adding the competency-based learning out of nowhere was tough, for sure, as a student. Um, just receiving all that information at once and just changing everything to the grading system, we didn't know how to receive feedback. We didn't know what mastery meant, everything else. It wasn't truly explained to us until further on. We kind of had to catch on ourselves. Um, it was difficult. Super interesting. Um, I, so th that may be a perfect launching point, actually, for my question, which was <laughs> you see a lot of pathways through the country of different ways of doing this, I suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us maybe, I, I, I both want to hear what you think the ideal one is, but also sort of the high, high level, what are some of the different pathways you see that seem to be effective? For approaching for the starting transition. To implement. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think Paula described like the, the big visioning process that mm -hmm. I see a lot of districts doing um, and really kind of investing in building the stakeholder and, and whatnot. Um, I think Andy mentioned um, that as a student, it felt like um, he just kind of received it all at once and it was being done to him. And I've seen some areas where they've really taken the time to um, help the kids emerge the model themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's another avenue, kind of getting the students to be able to articulate. They want better feedback, sorry. They want um, clearer targets and things of that nature. Um, so, and I've seen, and I'd say the majority of time, the work has started with teachers who want to unpack standards, who want to flesh out competencies, who want to create some sort of common calibration around what it means from classroom to classroom. And we've all done that work, common assessments, common rubrics. But around the competency movement, it has taken a different life, I think. And it's been a little bit more fleshed out. And so I see a lot of places where it has started as part of the, the teacher content work. Interesting. So uh, just so you all know, in about seven minutes or so, uh, we're going to go to uh, you for Q&A. Um, we'll have about 10 minutes. So there's microphones one, two, and three that I'll stand up to see anyone who lines up there uh, to, to call on you. But uh, I have several more questions uh, uh, until then. And if no one asks a question when we get there, I have more. So, Can I just piggyback yeah, on please. what she said? I think one of the pieces that she hinted at um, that I think is really important is teacher time. I think we need to really seriously look at our schedules, and, and it's one of the things that we did. When we started, we didn't have common planning time at the elementary schools. We had it at the middle, we had it at the high. It wasn't really structured around these types of conversations. Teachers weren't getting into each other's rooms to see best practice. Um, the coaching model didn't look like that. It, was, it felt um, a little uncomfortable at first for teachers to go there. But if we look at the performance in the highest performing countries, they provide their teachers with so much more time with one another to develop their craft, to re receive coaching like professional athletes still receive coaching even this deep into their career. And our teachers need that too. And so if you're in a role where you're an administrator and have control over that, that is the greatest gift that you can give our students is to give our teachers time. So have you gone about rejiggering the schedule to actually do that? What, what does it look like now? Yeah, so um, we have our teacher teams have, uh, they have time with one another to look at the curriculum, break it down, look at student work, um, develop some of these projects. Um, they have time to work with students to do these things as well. Uh, for example, we have um, 
a committee at the high school that is really working toward making our curriculum more culturally relevant and working on more culturally relevant teaching practices and the students are a part of that curriculum team. Um, so that we're also bringing the um, students in as design um, thinkers. We're redoing the high school um, schedule. They had um, CPT every other week. Now it's uh, weekly. The middle school team meets on a regular basis. Uh, it's guided around the principles that we're trying to achieve and there's accountability um, to it, but there's also time for that to happen. And, and have you redone the schedule to allow that? Like what's, what's, yeah. what is it like yeah, time so block? We've, what does yeah, it look like? We've, we've added in um, extra opportunities for students to have different electives to allow a, a schedule that allows teachers to be freed up. We've changed our lunch blocks and our recess blocks to allow time. We don't have teachers doing duties for the most part. That was one of the biggest shifts that gave us teacher time. Um, if you know our teachers are our most valuable asset that can help our students, then they shouldn't be doing you know cafeteria duty or recess duty. We should be finding other ways to allow that to happen so that they can work together as a collaborative team. Do you all have insights on how that works really well to give the teachers the, 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 the right time to both be planning but spending time with students? Sure. I mean, uh, again, being an innovation program and we, uh, everything has been done a little bit um, differently. But so we had um, a lot of time but yet not enough time because it wasn't just competence-based learning. It was everything. It was sort of creating a, a school within a school. Um, but so we had um, a few weeks during the summer where we paid teachers to come in. Then every teacher had what would be equivalent to a half-time teaching schedule the first mm. year of the ramp-up year. Um, that, it, that won't be the norm that's doing it, but we were, there was just so much happening at once, so there, there was a lot of time, but there will, be, there will continue to be certainly common planning time. Um, at, at they have it at least once or twice a week, but I mean, they're meeting on a regular basis. Um, I am not as familiar with the schedules in a lot of buildings, but from my personal experience, um, at our high school, we, the departments had um, 80 minutes every other day. Uh-huh. Um, it was phenomenal. And uh, it's, that's huge right there. Um, at our middle school, teams could meet um, at least once a day for a 30 to 35 minute block. And it was the same thing you talked about. It was calibrating around student work and whatnot. At the elementary, we, we were less successful, but similarly, there were electives and we tried to make sure teachers weren't doing lunch duty, um, that they had three 40-minute times per week mm -hmm. that they could meet uh, in grade teams. Um, and I think that is absolutely critical to the work. Maine also, as part of the law, originally had a percentage of money that just came to schools as grants. And many, many, many schools used that as um, uh, kind of brought subs in so teams of teachers could work mm. together, visit other schools, paid PD in the summer. So uh, about two minutes, and we're going to go out to uh, uh, questions. Um, but uh, before, I, I'd love to hear uh, what, so awkward question for Jump Rope that is a digital tool. But uh, what digital tools are you all using uh, to support the competency-based learning that you're doing in your schools? Um, and maybe your version of it can be, where are you seeing the most traction of competency-based mm -hmm. learning nationwide? So. Andy, do you want to talk about it? Um, like explaining how it is? Like yeah, the technology. What using? technology tools um, are you using? Yeah. We're using a program called Lyft. And mm -hmm. with that program, um, as a student, I'm able to uh, complete a task and put myself in a placement of where I'm at. I could put myself as developing that I need more help with it from a teacher. And if I do, a teacher will give me feedback. If I put myself as mastery, a teacher will reply back if they agree or not, and so on and so forth, if I could put myself higher or lower. Um, for us, we really struggled with finding high quality um, tech tools that um, provided the level of rigor that we were looking for. Uh, on a few occasions, we did land on tools that we adopted and, and um, for different reasons, for example, 10 marks no longer being um, available, uh, we've lost some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're really, what where our real focus is, is in on a true blended learning approach. 
Um, it's really more on a deeper learning approach where technology is to allow students to do things they couldn't do otherwise, like connect with other classrooms mm -hmm. around the world. And that, for us, that's a better fit. Where we are using the technology um, for the specific purpose of this work is we have um, a platform called Richer Picture where the students are building their portfolios and we're able to track the proficiencies. Um, and we're using Seesaw um, at the elementary school so that the students are able to reflect and demonstrate to their parents what they're doing, mm. which has been huge. The more that we're able to involve parents in seeing what the students are learning and why they're learning it um, has been powerful in helping us continue to move the work forward. Nationwide, well, any other tools you'd add or? Uh... No, we're, I'm, yeah, yeah, I mean, Lyft okay. is really what we've been using. And nationwide, yeah. Um, I think nationwide what I see is um, there's a lot of learner management systems out there, um, and uh, districts take them on initially, and then when they get to the point of having to somehow aggregate the evidence and do a report, they often contact us because they're finding that the learner management systems don't kind of do that piece. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And so, and the other things we get asked a lot to integrate with is learner management systems, um, portfolio systems. Um, those are probably the two biggest, most frequent things we see that people try to connect with a grade book. And then there are several that are standalone grade books as well. Right now, the learning management systems that are available and things that make um, the data visible to teachers in a way that is really user friendly. I'm Doesn't sorry exist. if any of you are in the room, but they're just not where they need to be yet. Awesome. Uh, so, or not awesome, but, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> thank, but thank, you for, thank, you, thank you for the statement. So uh, <laughs> it, uh, as we go to Q&A, uh, just two requests. Just quickly say your name and where you're from, um, and then make sure whatever you uh, say ends with a question mark. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Mandy. I'm a first year MBA student at Harvard Business School. Uh, I have two questions. One uh, is, um, uh, do you guys see any sort of standardization in terms of competency-based assessment? Um, if not, then what are the ways to sort of compare results across the district? Uh, and the second question is, uh, what are some of the ways to train teachers uh, to adapt to uh, competency-based assessment? Let's take it. Um, so I think there's different ways of standardization. So standardized rubrics um, and looking at the work as a collaborative team is one way. In, term of, in terms of the assessments that our state has right now, um, I mean, I think if you're working on competency-based instruction and you're doing it well and doing it deeply, students are going to do well on whatever type of standardized assessment that's put in front of them. Um, but the real piece is that feedback that comes out of the more rubric-based um, feedback to the student around what they're actually doing. Training teachers is huge. Uh, we're, pro we're providing teachers with um, release days. Um, we have induction coaches for our newest teachers. They work with them 90 minutes a week. Um, to refine their craft so we're not losing our newest teachers. We're providing instructional coaching. Um, we're modeling, we're opening our classroom doors. Uh, there's a, 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 a huge amount of professional learning that's happening in my district. And I think one of the more powerful pieces is that we're, we've landed on visible learning strategies that we've all agreed to so that there is consistency and standardization around what instructional strategies we know from learning sciences are working. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Marlon Davis from Validated Learning. Uh, also have two questions. Uh, they center around equity and accountability. Um, how can these systems be equitable or provide equitable access for students who have special needs, English as a second language, or other types of, 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 of issues that may impede their progress? What's being done to make sure that they have access to that? And then when in terms of accountability, I've heard a lot on stage about self-directed, student-directed. So when and if the student is not successful, where does the buck stop? Is it because the student wasn't savvy enough and couldn't make it? Or is there a professional learning environment or person who is going to be in charge of that, that um, progress? Thank you. So I can certainly speak to the to the um, second piece, um, which is why we have our advisory. I mean, certainly we feel like the buck stops with the adults, but the the learning and the ownership is still on the students 
but there's people, I mean, they work closely as a team and they're following up, but it's pretty hard to get away from your advisor when you have how many people in the room, like six other students yeah. in the room, um, and you're meeting on a regular basis and they're talking to you about what you're doing or you're not doing. Um, we have our program, um, we, we had hoped that we would get a diverse group and we got a very diverse group. Um, in terms of learners, we have EL students, we have special ed students, um, we have regular ed students from different communities um, and it, it's, it's working with, I really think it's working with all of them. I mean, students who aren't making it are just, they're just not sort of allowed, allowed to not do it with all of the, the um, connection and attention sort of I, given to them. I think building on that, uh, the way that learning is now um, under this system, students have multiple ways of demonstrating what they know. And so we're able to reach more students rather than fewer students. Uh, and I think that that's really one of the most powerful things. We're able to use universal design for um, learning to design with the student. We set the learning targets. We measure those learning targets. The measures are the same. Um, but the demonstration, the way students are demonstrating may be different. Um, and that has been extremely powerful for students. Equity continues to be a huge issue. Um, your zip code kind of dictates what you get when you go to school. And that's something that I think that we as a larger, wider stakeholder group uh, need to address and, and be very, very honest about. Um, my school is almost booked to capacity with seats. We, are, we have like 15 seats open that we're going to start offering to any students um, who are within our state that want to attend. Um, but that's not, that's only a teeny tiny fraction of the students who might want to go to a school like ours. Um, and so, you know, 90% of our students are going to comprehensive traditional schools across the country. And what are we doing as a collective stakeholder group to address that? Walter. Hello, my name is Walter Duncan, co-founder of the Validated Learning Company and 15-year teacher. I'm going to take my business hat off and put on my teacher hat. But before I do, I want to shout out Andy. Thank you for sharing your voice as a student. Everyone in this room needs to hear it, and we need to listen to it carefully, because you will solve the Amen. problems that we leave your generation behind. Uh, this question is for Elizabeth and Paula. Uh, as a teacher, I felt that it seemed like every single year there was a new thing, <laughs> something new, something new, that I had to do a whole bunch of stuff to be able to deal with. Uh, so my question to you is, how do you um, help your teachers mm -hmm. feel like competency-based learning is, some, is different mm -hmm. and will help them achieve their goals and that it's worth them investing all that time and that it's not going to be a fad that then shifts one or two years later when they feel like, you know, they could have just mm -hmm. spent that time in personal relationship with students, helping them grow and develop. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, but that is, a, that is competency-based, those relationships. I mean, that's what it's all about. You can't achieve this without having strong relationships with your students. Um, what we did was we started to show teachers what they were already doing that was aligned to this work. And so in showing them that we already were engaging in some great practices, some not so great practices that we could leave aside, um, then we were able to do that. We had um, this middle, middle school meeting where we were first engaging in this. And um, the teachers actually were very, very nervous because assessments in our district are very, very important. I actually signed a fake permission slip <laughs> saying, you know, I give you permission to let go, to drop things off your plate so that you can engage deeply in this work alongside the students. It was symbolic, but it was powerful. Um, I think, again, we're sort of in this unique situation with the um, innovation school because people who signed on for it doesn't mean that it wasn't a struggle, but signed on to, to do things differently as it was. So um, th they do have too many things on their plate, but they sort of knew that they were signing up for that. I think when I think of the, the rest of our school, because um, there are competencies for all the vocational programs and vocational programs in Massachusetts often pride themselves on being competency-based, but we aren't truly, again, thinking of our grading system, not that they're not trying to get them to meet all the competencies that they need to for their Chapter 74 programs, but they're not when they're getting their A, B, and C. So when that auto mechanic leaves and has a C or has an a, as a B, it might be that he could do everything but do something with the engine that then he's going to be working on someone's car or she's going to be working on someone's car and there's going to be a big problem if that's the part they didn't do well on, but nobody knows it. Um, so. 
as we are looking to, um, we have to do competency reporting, for instance, um, but it has been a rote thing that has been like, okay, let's check it off, but not really that deep learning. So we are gonna work very slowly with the rest of the school, um, at least on the vocational side, meaning we're not sure what we're doing with the, with the rest of the classes, but to help them understand the thing that we know that they're so tied to, um, that students are truly learning the trade or the career area that they're going in. So we're gonna be doing a very slow rollout, but it's about having them see that relevancy and that meaning that it's there, but we just have not been doing it like that. Um, in, well, I can say at our school anyways. Yeah, uh, just as a teacher, I wanna thank you for your commitment and dedication to make it happen. We heard yesterday a lot about the skills gap in the um, career world where these students will be going, and I feel like the work that you're doing will put them out there with much less of a, a gap, so thank you. Perfect. So I think that's a great way to sum up. I just want to say uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Andy, I hope you're getting some uh, competency out of uh, uh, mastery of, of, of some uh, outcomes for being up here and, and, and performing so well. And, and big shout out to all of you. So uh, thanks so much.